Christopher Hitchens is here. He is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and a visiting professor at the New School. His books include Letters to a Young Contrarian and Why Orwell Matters. His new book is called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back. Nice to be back. All right. Let me first talk about Iraq before we talk about God. Okay. Or the absence of God in your judgment. Um, Iraq is being destroyed by the parties of God. Iraqi society is being poisoned by theocracy and its uh, killers and torturers. It's a good place to start. Why not? Where do you think it's going to go? Where do you think it's going to end up? And I might add that I, I have very little patience with people who say that uh, the mass murder and slaughter and torture of Iraqis is all the fault of George Bush or Paul Bremer. They may have made a lot of blunders there, but the people who are doing the killing are the ones who should be blamed, and they do it in God's name, and they even kill their co-religionists over an, insig mean, so over, over yeah. an insignificant... And, or difference. destroy their own religious sites. Over, yes, they blow up a mosque which no secularist would ever, ever, no atheist would ever allow. The desecration of a, of a building, a religious building in that way. I mean, it horrifies me. And we have a natural resistance in ourselves to, to desecration, to profanity. To blow up a mosque? Um, you think the Golden Dome at Samara, one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, callously destroyed by people in the name of God. This is, that this was is by, why... That was by... This is why I wanted, that was by Al-Qaeda, not, uh, not so much Sunni Shia. It's by Al-Qaeda. It unleashed Al Sunni Al Shia because Al-Qaeda meant to do that. Al-Qaeda is a Sunni gang with, backed by, including the person who committed that awful crime, a former member of Saddam Hussein's secret police, by the way, Bathurst. But th their aim is to start a Sunni Shia. So, well, that's how pitiless they are. That's how justified their faith-based mm. politics make them. Notwithstanding your own support in the beginning, notwithstanding the acknowledgement by lots of people, uh, both who are who are like the president or don't like the president, all the mistakes, do you think it's going to end in defeat for the United States? Um, I do now think it is, because I think that it's become evident to a large number of people in the region that they only have to wait, that the United States is not going to stay. Even the president only talks about time to for withdrawal now. Petraeus has said there is a Washington clock which is running faster than the Baghdad well, clock. Well, people have, you don't have to have a very strong sense of history or timing, which in the, in the region they do have a fairly strong sense of, okay, this is a phase that will be over soon. Well, that means our friends are going to be gutted and slaughtered. The people who trusted us are going to be, uh, well, they'll be lucky if they die quickly. Um, the, and so what the, does it a do? country with more oil than Saudi Arabia or Iran will fall into the hands of the scum of the earth. Um, I hope those who want well, to well, detach well, from it are going to okay, be happy but, with what they get. Okay, stop there. I mean, look, some of that. First of all, you say it's the defeat for us, and, and what are the consequences? It's not a defeat for us. It's a defeat for Iraqi and Kurdish society. Because they suffer the consequences. Mm, yeah. But are there consequences for the United States, in your judgment, or for the United States yes. and Great Britain? Yeah, living with the shame of betraying the democratic Iraqis and living with the hell that will overcome their society when the parties of God have their way, and living with the knowledge that the keystone state in the region, the one between the theocracy in Iran... In Iran. In Iran, the Shia right. theocracy, and the Sunni theocracy, the Wahhabi theocracy in, in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia, and a country, Iraq, that has more oil than either of them, well, does it which have could more have made oil? all the yes. We, we've, yes. A, we've done a lot of prospecting and exploring. Who is we? Our side. Well, I'm not no, ashamed no, no, to call it. No, no, well, for no, example, no, I don't mean that, but because I haven't seen serious, that. Petraeus, serious... wait, General Petraeus on the show last week said that Iran, because of new discoveries, is now the second largest. Iraq, you mean? Iraq is now the second largest yes. source of oil, not yeah. the first. You just said it'll have more oil than Iran well, and Saudi it, Arabia I together. Already, I think it already had more than Saudi Arabia. But the discoveries are I'm interesting. Some difference are very that. interesting, too, because they're in our, they're, the newest ones are in Al Anbar province. Right. The, huge, thinly populated province that Al-Qaeda thinks it can take over, that extends between Baghdad and the border of Jordan. Now, that's where the, which means that you could have a fair distribution of oil, because up till now, most of the oil has been in Shia or Kurdish areas. We've done a lot of prospecting and investigation. And now we're going to give all this away, this fantastic wealth, on a choke point of the Gulf in the world economy. We're going to give it away to the parties of God just to satisfy... Uh, a public opinion that's been conditioned for defeat. I, I mean, if you, if the United States thinks it can live with a shame like that, it'll have to get ready to do so. And but how? Will, okay, two things. One, how will it affect our reputation and credibility in the rest of the world? Will that? Will we be said well, to I mean, have? <laughs> you don't want to be or go to war with the United States, or you don't want to be involved with the United States because, in the end, the pain will be too much, and they will leave. 
or mm, you could put it more or would it be that. said the United States is a fool and they went to war on a mistaken assumption and they should never have gone in there and look what it did and they are not to be trusted? You could. Th those, I could put it much more pungently than that. Not to say that you were verbose, but I mean, I think the short way of saying it is this. It will become evident that it's more dangerous in that region to be a friend of ours than to be an enemy. And that's a pretty final judgment, don't you? You have no criticism of the Iraqis per se, because after the toppling of Saddam, their opportunity to change their own country. What we are missing now is a political solution. Well, I'm a great friend of the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan and uh, President Talibani's party. Right. And I was recently in uh, those provinces of northern Iraq, Kurdistan. I was in Baghdad as well. I spent most of my time in the north where they've done everything we could have asked of them. Uh, there are no American or British soldiers there. They don't need them. There hasn't been a car bomb or an attack of that sort since 2004. But, but clearly Kurdistan they, is they, not, they not, was not what Baghdad was. No, but it was the most. It used to be the most tribal, the most backward, the most primitive, mountainous part of the country. They used to, and the Kurds used to kill each other, but for tribal reasons, not religious. They, one thing they don't do, they don't have mullahs there in a big way. They, everyone's a Muslim, Sunni Muslim actually, but the imams don't rule. Now, women go to school and no one wears a veil, that sort of thing. But, but that's fairly recent too. They, and they've they've solved their own problems. The, the internecine where they don't shoot each other anymore. They've acted in an exemplary manner. Uh, so much so that we don't even notice them. And not, none of our people has ever been killed there, and they're building a memorial for the American soldiers who have been killed as, elsewhere. And it's just openly, callously said by the majority leader of the United States Senate, never mind, we just, want out. We just want out. The hell with them. Let them, let, them, let them hang. We've betrayed the Kurds, what, three, four times before, ever since cursing there? Now, we, without conscience, planning to do it again? I just say for shame, Charlie, I just do. I'm, I'm not going to let it happen. Well, I'm making a huge round. I hope you'll join me on this point. On which point? To support we the cannot, Kurds? We cannot, abandon the, the, Kurds. we cannot abandon the nascent democracy that we have certainly helped to come to in power. Kurdistan. In Kurdistan. One-fifth of the country, yes. We, and we're still, we can still hold that up as an example. We can say to the other Iraqis, you're free to follow this example if you like, or you can go with God is great, and you'll see what will happen, the Talibanization of what was once a civilized country. Talibanization. Um, will Iraq, in your judgment, become a failed state? Well, I, I have to say that in some ways it, it's always met that definition in that it's, it's a somewhat confected country uh, created by Winston Churchill in a, what, not that. his finest moment and cobbled together a bit. Right. It's almost, but that's not what it's we mean by been, failed state. By failed state, been, we need a place where there's no central authority and... Yeah. and People like Al Qaeda can, in well, a sense, if you mean a live failed, a failed and find state, a haven. A failed state on the order of Somalia. So yes, it could become that. Is becoming that now, and, will and in the middle of the Middle East, in a will bordering with Iran become and that if we cut Syria Iran. and yes. Jordan. Yes. So it, it could be a Rwanda on the Gulf or a Somalia on the Gulf. That's not just a failed state in its own terms. It's a, it's it's a huge civilizational failure that we that for us to allow this to happen to a keystone country in society. We can't, we shouldn't even be considering it, but it, in fact, people can't wait for it to happen fast, no fast enough. Why do you think you've been so unsuccessful in being able to convince your intellectual friends to come to the side you're on? Oh, Charlie, um, I think for this reason, um, everything that went wrong or has gone wrong is indeed going wrong in Iraq. It's, in my opinion, the result of having postponed the intervention for so long. If Saddam Hussein had been taken out in 1991, we would still be complaining about the losses we took and the chaos that was caused by it. But we would, we would not realize what we saved ourselves from. We wouldn't realize that that means Iraq doesn't go through the next 10 years of sanctions and misery and social implosion, civil war, disintegration, all of this, from which we, we may not now be able to rescue it. But the... But we could not ignore our responsibility. Iraq is a major American responsibility. We, we've, we've acquired major responsibilities and debts there. We've made major promises, created major messes that it's our, partly our responsibility to clean up. Intellectuals, I think, perhaps aren't that keen on that argument. They basically wish that they never had to hear about the place. Come on. I mean, that's what most people wish. Couldn't we have skipped this whole thing? Answer no. <clears throat> have to face it. Which goes to the core of your belief that America should use its power 
to knock off bad regimes wherever they see them. Yes, because our existence is incompatible with those. Not on, not on a moral crusade, so to say. At some point, they At will the end, overtake we've us. We've always found out that, uh, in, in the end, we cannot coexist with psychopathic, aggressive, expansionist, totalitarian regimes. We've usually waited to see if we could do this with anything short of war, and it's got worse because so, it's been postponed. So whether it's Nazism or communism, in the end, you have to Yeah, and compete. If, if we'd done this to Saddam Hussein in 1991, we would be living in a better world. We just wouldn't know it, because we wouldn't know how much worse it would have been putting it off. But did you think Saddam Hussein per se was a threat? You? Or just would, simply was a guy it really who was on human, rights, on a human rights record? Um, oh, was, no, a, no. was a tyrant and deserved to be overthrown because he engaged in his own version of genocide. Well, the case for that would be complete on its own terms. For any country that had signed, as we have done, the Genocide Convention, which mandates intervention either to prevent or punish genocide, yeah, that would be complete on its own terms. But he'd invaded uh, two of his neighbors, um, one of them not even invaded, had occupied, taken over, annexed. Um, Kuwait, and it was kicked out Iran, of Kuwait. Iran, and, and, and in Iran, Iran and that war was over. Yeah, yeah. That and war then, was over, and, and he, he was in a weakened rest state. Restless pursuit of programs of weapons of mass destruction, and a, a detail often overlooked of the personal paymaster and armorer of the suicide bombers among the Palestinians. Well, he gave the, gifts of $25,000 yeah, to every, families every of, them, of yeah. suicide bombers. Yeah. Undermining uh, the al Fatah uh, PLO leadership, uh, uh, supporting everywhere he could the most extreme jihadist fundamentalists. People think he had nothing to do with jihadism. He had everything to do with jihadism. Financing uh, the man who uh, murdered Leon Klinghoffer when arrested, Abu Abbas, when detained by the Italian police, had to be let go, remember? Yes. Why was he let go? I don't know. It's pretty, pretty odd. The guy just hijacked the Achille Lara and rolled no, an no, old no, man's no. wheelchair off the... Why was he let go? Because he was travelling on a pass an Iraqi diplomatic passport. Clearly, diplomatic passport. I don't want to go... I don't want to... OK. Because of time, because... I, but, but, I, I mean, you, are you clearly arguing that the president, who now says there was no link between... Let me just stay with the idea, because everybody will email me on this point. I bet they will. Are you... You're not suggesting that there was a link between Saddam and 9-11, which is a different issue, are you? Um, I know that the man who blew up the World Trade Center, who mixed the explosives for the 93 bombing... Yes. You mean you went, know him personally because no, you've talked no, to no, him? No, no, no. I know, I know, I know, I know, I knew him. Yeah. I know that that man went straight when released by our brilliant FBI. Right. Uh, after being detained um, on bail. Yeah. <laughs> went straight to Iraq which is a very hard country to get into, just as then it was a very hard country to get out of and was uh, kept under Saddam Hussein's hospitality ever afterwards. I'm, I'm in favour of making the worst assumption about Saddam Hussein at all times, but I uh, know no uh, more than anyone else about any direct connection with him and 9-11. Between, between him and Al-Qaeda, there's a lot which, of overlap. Which Tenet and which is book you reviewed, I want to come to that <laughs> in a moment. Well, come stay, hold off on that for a second. Uh, but the president and... and Almost everybody else stepped forward and said there was no 9/11 Saddam link. Well, they were they were they were uh, not, not arguing against and, anyone. And said the, there was. most of the commissions coming out say that that when in fact there was a there was contact between say Saddam and perhaps Al Qaeda, but there wasn't any collaboration. Uh, you are suggesting well, something uh, different. Or I know. Not? I make two points. One. We know of very direct operational collaboration between Iraq and, oddly enough, the Al Qaeda affiliate in the Philippines, the Abu Sayyaf group, di directly supported by the Iraqi embassy in Manila. What has Iraq got to do with the foreign policy of the Philippines? Why are they interested in trying to create a separate Muslim state in the in the archipelago? Why are they the oldest one of the oldest causes of Al Qaeda? I don't know. Um, as for the connection with the main branch. Um, we know they flirted with each other. We know they admired and praised each other. We know they both said they had a common enemy. Um, my view would be um, that's as far as it's ever going to go. We're not going to wait to find out the rest. That's enough. Goodbye. We are and not. That's there is, the, that is, that that's that is the closest. That is the closest. To topple, that is the closest. The head of the Iraqi government. When, 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 when Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, not our friends, were throwing out people with Al, with Al Qaeda. Uh, Connections. Well, after 9 wait, Iraq you, was inviting them in. As you, Iraq as, was inviting as you them in. You want, you want to take them, that chance? Wait, wait, but as you dis, I'm not. This is not a. As you dismiss them, uh, a whole series of American presidents considered both of them, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, our friend. Mm -hmm. So much more for them. Right. These people were inside our defense perimeter, and the Pakistanis were the patrons of the Taliban. The Taliban is another name for Pakistani colonization of Afghanistan, and they were the incubators of Al Qaeda. 
and they had Al Qaeda sympathizers in their nuclear program. And and you think and the Bashar... CIA knew nothing about it? The okay. CIA knew nothing about now, it. Before I turn to this book, mm -hmm. uh, two of your best friends are Ian McEwen and Martin Amos, correct? Yes, I'm proud to say. Yeah, I am. So am I. They're Ian is the dedicatee of this book. I understand that. Uh, do they share different points of view on this that are with respect to the Iraqi war that you have? Um, the position they take on the Iraq war is one of um, disappointment. I mean by that to say that they, they were with me in hoping that it would be a success and in believing that it was justified. I don't think they would have gone as far as I did in saying it was also necessary and inevitable, but they would have both said, do say it was justified. And they are distressed, um, as many of America's friends from afar are, by the, um, by the unbelievable sabotage of Iraqi society that the, um, has been undertaken by the parties of God in order that uh, the society be destroyed rather than allowed a chance at federalism, secularism or democracy. And that is that they do understand is the real problem. They do, they're very clear about jihadism being the main enemy, both of them. Tony Blair leaves government. Yes. Are you sad about that? Very, yeah. I think it's a great loss. And I, unfortunately... After 10 years, by the way. It will be 10 years, I think today. I think something today. Like, or May Day, something, very recent, this week. Um, I, would, I wanted him to stay on until he'd uh, at least outlived Mrs. Thatcher in power, her record. How long was she there? 10, 11? I think it was nearly 14. Was it? Really? Yeah, amazing. And um, it's unfortunately, it's his own fault. He set his own timetable. And he, once he announced that he wouldn't complete a term, another term, he changed the subject not from whether you're going to retire to when. So he could never get any peace from this question and there was no other topic of conversation. His fault, pity. This book is called God is Not Great. God is in small letters and larger is not and then great is mm -hmm. at the center. Subtitle, How Religion Poisons Everything. Clearly by God you mean any God, not a any particular religious God, any particular faith. Any God is yes. Not any right. surrender of the reason. idea of any surrender, any belief, any faith in a God, mm. credulity poisons everything. Yeah. yeah, credulity, superstition, the building of altars and idols, the, the worship of non-existent entities, the attempt to derive morality from um, from the supernatural. All of that is um, more, I think, than mistaken or, or irritating, um, it's becoming actually very menacing now. The people who think they have permission of that sort from the heavens are trying to kill us. Or sometimes more mildly insisting that our children be taught nonsense in schools or telling us that AIDS may be bad in Africa but condoms are much worse or stem cell research shouldn't be done. Or, but wherever you turn, if you find this barbaric foe, you'll find that this person is, uh, is giving himself religious permission, yeah. Well, do you think there, do you find it interesting that if you just take uh, those who believe deeply in a God are more likely to be, in your judgment, militaristic? I don't know militaristic, but they think they have to be fanatical. I'll tell you why I say this. Um, because I think you yourself are a person of faith of, of some kind. I mean, if you, I don't know what it's like to be that, but if I thought that there was a personal saviour of a divine kind who had, was interested in my creation and followed my life and cared about it and would redeem me and give me an eternity in paradise if I only obeyed a f few simple rules, I, I would think it would make me very happy. I mean, it would be a source of infinite contentment oh, yeah. to me. Um, it doesn't seem for to lots have... of people it does, though. I no, dare for say, lots of people it does. I dare say it does. But I don't then... think most people live in fear; they live in love with respect. Well, to God. I would like to think that too, but I, you couldn't prove it by me because the way I meet them is they come to me and say, "I can't be happy until you believe it too." Well, yeah, that's part and of I want, the proselytizing. I don't, I'm not going to teach it. my children <laughs> yes, about the exactly. Virgin Birth. I want your children to. <laughs> yeah, now, exactly. so now, I'm sorry. Now it's not a division of opinion. Yeah. It's, it's gone beyond that. We can argue about whether Virgin Births are a good thing or whether they would prove that someone so born had better opinions, more believable opinions, which of course it doesn't. But that's an interesting argument. I could have it all night. I really thoroughly enjoy it. We should do it more often. But they won't leave me alone. They won't. And that makes me nervous because it makes me think, well, I don't think they can be very confident in their beliefs then. 
They, 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 they can't and, yet be happy. I don't believe it yet. As pro, they part have to save me too. No, as no, part no, of the no, promotion no, of this no, book, are you spending a lot of time? Are, is everybody who has a television program wanting you to sit across the table from somebody who's a believer? Yes, we've we've made a, we're spending most of the first swing of the tour is in the south, and we've issued successful challenges wherever we go to. Uh, or to actually say we, that's my publishers and I. I'm not using the we in the royal sense. I have said I'll. I'll I'll debate any professor of theology or any priest or rabbi or imam Speak. anywhere. And they've all said, yes, we have a challenge in every city now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I read this review I yesterday. This uh, Jack Miles is distinguished professor of English yes. and religious studies at, US, at UC Irvine. You've obviously read this. Sure, and I've read Jack's biography of God. And? Um, I was a bit disappointed with his review because it began by... By flatly misstating what I say in my book, I mean, he starts by saying, "Fighting the good fight for atheism isn't as easy as it looks. The fighter must, on one hand, proclaim that religion is fading fast and for good reason; yet, yes. on the other, rouse fellow or prospective atheist to be on guard against it." And I start, and I start by saying, wonder. "And I start by saying, it's not fading and it never can. It's ineradicable. He, he, I can't believe." I'm not the worst or, or, or uh, most opaque writer in the world. He can't have, no, he cannot possibly not. have mistaken my <laughs> no. purpose. I say repeatedly, Freud is right. Religion is ineradicable. It cannot fade. It can, but it can be brought under control. It can be divested. Why has it survived? Well, Jack Miles' his review is complete. I'm afraid, I'm, I hate to say it for such a learned fellow, it's a worthless one. I mean, just, he didn't, he didn't get the main point of the book. And to, why has it, I mean, reviewers make this point left and right. Why has it survived as it has? Yeah. Well, the one, the, the essay that I it? quote is the Freud on the future of an illusion, which where he says, look, it comes from wish thinking, uh, which is a very strong impulse in our cortex, that the, the yeah. wish is father to the thought. We don't terribly want to die. And religion says, well, you don't. The connection between what it preaches and what people might want to hear is too intimate to be overlooked, I think. And I think it gives the atheists like myself a slight advantage in an yeah. argument in that I'm not thrilled at the prospect of being annihilated. I don't look forward to it. I'm uh, not bored by the idea, but I can't really see that it isn't going to happen or that an exception will be made in my case if I agree to have myself circumcised or, or suck on some wafer or obey some other um, man-made injunction. I can't persuade myself that I'd be redeemed that way. And I'm, I know that millions of people can't either. But millions apparently can, and they're the ones I'm arguing with. You have carried this idea with you for a long time. Yes, it was the first real intellectual discovery that I made. I, I couldn't believe Why what I was it? hearing in Sunday school. Well, as soon as I say <laughs> this, you're going to jump me. Mm -mm. Why has it taken you so long to write this book? Well, you know, I, we've, you and I say every time we've met, at least some of our conversation has always been about Faith and non-faith. I mean, I've been writing chapters of this book, oh, right, 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 articles. Right, right. Yeah. Well, no, our, no, our conversation is always decades. about. No, our conversation with you, which I think have been very good, by the way. I think so too. Is always about what do you believe? I mean, yes. When you come to this table, I want to know who you are, what do you believe, and what are the consequences, and what's the argument for and against where you well, state, I think where you our take your stand. Early chats was about my book on Mother Teresa, for yeah, example. Yeah, we did. We had that. Yeah. Where I took on the religious, uh, what I thought was their strongest. Well, we also, Jefferson, you were here. You've been here for Jefferson, every book. If I do not yeah. invite you for a book, then you call me up and say you didn't invite me, because I can't remember any of them we haven't invited I'm sure, you here. I'm sure you've never let me down. And a lot of it has been, I've, well, I've been writing this book all my life. It's in, not so much letting you down. It's not, I don't want to let conversation down. Thank you. Well, I'm all, almost everything that I write is in one way or another against About, the faith-based view of life. It's, uh, um, yeah. And the, this might be the moment to say that, you see, people say, well, in that case, where would your consolation be? Where would your higher feelings come from? When I say, you know, we have a not too bad tradition of Democritus and Epicurus and the Greek philosophers who discovered the world was made of atoms and um, the great humanists who, uh, like Spinoza, who said that there may conceivably be a supernatural Entity, but he doesn't intervene in your daily life. Don't, don't what did run Einstein away with say about God? Well, Einstein took the same view. He was a Spinozist, actually. Mm -hmm. He said very, very directly, he said, the, may, the universe is so marvelous right. that he said, you believe, in, you, you believe in God because there are no miracles. Right. It's because the thing itself is miraculous the order, right. the symmetry, right. the beauty of nature and science. That's right. interruptions in this. Miracles are, are for conjurers. The, the wonderful thing is. But that's not where you are. And he said, but it's so, he said he couldn't bear the thought that there was Not a power nothing. power. But he said, but he, this God doesn't care. He doesn't bother with our lives. 
He didn't, he didn't even know where. Yeah. Um, he was a spinner. But he's there. But he, but he, Einstein he was, a, was a great, yeah. it was a great secular humanist moralist right. who witnessed for, you've probably had Walter on by now. I have. It's a great book, I think. Right. Um, I'm very, uh, very, uh, very envious of it. Uh, envious of? Of Walter's book. I'd love to have written a book on Einstein. I have a lot on Einstein in my book, but it's not as good as Walter's. Yeah. Here's a subject, I have to go, but here's a subject Please. for another time, which is, you know, we've talked, uh, touched on this before. It is how you make the choices you do. You know, you wrote a book on Jefferson. Now this, I mean, is it, are there, what is the common theme that connects the things that you feel powerful enough to write about? A, your two great friends, Martin Amos and Ian McEwan, are novelists. Well, I'm not able to write fiction. I don't have the gift for it. Really? Or anything remotely like it. Uh, by the way, I think I know what separates fiction from non-fiction writers, by the way. Which I is? think. Um, the people I know who write fiction usually have a, a good understanding of music. Um, and I don't, really, at all. And so it's true of a lot of my non-fiction writers. We're not musical. I think that may be the crucial faculty for poets and novelists as opposed to essayists like myself. On the other point, these subjects tend to choose me, but they all come from the same wellspring. The people I admire are the great skeptics and um, non-believers like, like Thomas Jefferson. And the, my next subject, Thomas Paine, yeah. author of The Age yeah. of Reason and the Rights of Man. Um, George Orwell. Um, Charles Darwin. Well, I, I'm not clever enough to write about Charles Darwin, but yes, a tremendous hero of mine. Had lunch yesterday with his great grandson, Matthew Chapman, who you should have on. He's written a beautiful book about the trial in Dover, Pennsylvania, on the intelligent design right. scandal. Right. Um, so these subjects, in a sense, pick me. And um, if you want to write about America, which I do, that's why I moved here. It's the great subject for a writer. Then, in effect, you're always writing about Thomas Jefferson. He was a great nation builder. He was the author of our Declaration of Independence. He was the man who doubled the size of the country with the Louisiana Purchase. Man who set off troops for the first foreign war against the Muslim pirates in North Africa. I mean, it's an extraordinary life. Founded the University of Virginia. Um, wrote the, um, sorry, rewrote the New Testament. I mean, you know, took a testament in one hand, a razor in the other, produced the Jefferson Bible. And that was his retirement job. I mean, it's astonishing. Great botanist. <clears throat> Never wrote a book, Great, did no, he? No, but he's... Never wrote a book. But his, his collected letters are majestic work. And this book um, is called God is Not Great, How Religion... proves that the greatness of the United States is in its secular constitution. He is most... He took most pride in one... He founded the university... Not being president. Founded the University of Virginia. He wrote the articles... Uh, the Virginia uh, Statute on Religious Freedom. On Religious that, Freedom. That's on his obelisk. Right. He wanted to remember for that... The Declaration and, and the University. The and the Declaration, the Virginia Declaration, becomes the First Amendment to the Constitution, which says the state can't intervene in religion. And we have no idea how lucky we are to have this constitutional protection. God is not great how religion poisons everything. Christopher Hitchens, thank you for coming. Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.